Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome out. Uh, I'm Larry Korea. Um, yeah, we, yeah, would you? It's a little loud. I got I got nasty tinnitus anyway, so like like the whole open door hallway thing kills me. Uh huh. Actually, and we'll talk about that. That's the importance of wearing hearing protection. Hey, for your story, because otherwise all your action here should have tinnitus. Yes. Um, like I do. It's bad. Um, so I'm Larry Korea, and I, I think most of you guys probably know who I am, so I won't waste a lot of time on the on the author bio, but I write a bunch of books, uh, a bunch of different series, been doing this for about 12 years now, they've done really well. Um, uh, Monster Hunter series, I started out very gun nutty, because I self-published my first book, it was back in the days of the internet gun forums, and so I actually advertised my first book on the internet gun forums. It's how I built my original self-published audience. Uh, and so I actually gun nutted up the first book. Uh, like in the reviews, people were like, wow, the gun, this, this is the most lurid gun descriptions I've ever seen in a book. That was specifically an editorial decision on purpose, okay, because of my target audience for my first self-published novel. And then um, I've written a bunch of other series, most of which have guns in them. Now, non-writer background, uh, I was in the gun business for most of my life. Uh, I've been a firearms instructor for years and years. I've retired now. I was a concealed weapons instructor. I was the busiest instructor in my state for about 10 years. Uh, I certified about 3,500 people to carry guns uh, in Utah. Uh, I was a competition shooter for many years. I shot uh, various uh, th three gun primarily, the USPSA, IDPA, all these different pistol competitions and rifle and shotgun competitions. Uh, I owned a gun store. I was what's called an SOT, uh, Title Seven, which means I was a machine gun dealer. And we could actually manufacture legal machine guns and suppressors and that kind of thing, so that's what I did for a living. I uh, worked for a bunch of different things over the years, doing gun stuff and explodey stuff and training stuff and all that kind of good stuff. And I, uh, I love guns, so I was kind of a walking encyclopedia of gun knowledge. First, uh, uh, writing, first professional painting writing I ever did was actually I wrote for gun magazines. Uh, non-fiction. I wrote product reviews for gun magazines and gun reviews. Then when I got into fiction, I actually was on internet gun forums uh, where I was already well known. I started posting up free, fri free fiction 12 years ago, uh, advertising my self-published novel. <laughs> and that's how I started out. So I have a rep of being the gun guy. Uh, I use a lot of guns in fiction. And so what I want to do today is uh, I'm assuming you guys are all here because you're writers and you're trying to beef up your gun stuff. And we'll go from there. So we'll take questions at the end. I'm just gonna cover a bunch of stuff real fast. Um, I kind of do the fire hose of information things, so you know we'll go. We can go back and revisit. All right. So first off, most important thing: a lot of people get hung up on the gun stuff for one big reason. When you screw your gun stuff up in a book, your gunny readers are gonna freak out on you. The only group of people, demographically readers, that are worse and more picky than gun people are horse people. <laughs> <laughs> If you write fantasy and you have a horse that's basically, you know, it's a magical motorcycle that eats hay, horse people are going to kick your ass, okay? <laughs> so if you screw up a horse thing in a book, they're going to come scream at you. Gun people are the second worst, okay? If you screw up a gun thing in fiction, I guarantee you will hear about it, they will whine about it, and you'll get negative reviews. There's no safety on a glove. There's no safety on a That's the big one. <laughs> click, click! No, not on the yeah. Okay, so you're going to get that a lot. So basically, guys, you need to do enough research to... Make it sound like you know what you're talking about. If you think something sounds good but you're not sure, check it first, okay? I would recommend going out and actually getting some shooting experience. It will make your, your writing, the shooting parts better, okay? Because there's, there's some certain visceral things about shooting that if you haven't done it and get your knowledge comes from television, you're not gonna convey that in your writing. Uh, one of the reasons I get a, a rep of being a good fight scene writer is I've practiced a lot of this stuff and you experience things in the execution of it that you can then roll into the books to make those scenes feel more real and more personal and more emotional. So shooting is like that. Um, the noise, the recoil, all guns feel different. The weight, uh, the sound of it, the smell of it. These are all things that you can put into your books to make it feel more realistic. And you can almost always tell when you're reading a, a gun scene from a person that's never actually shot a gun, because it's horrible. <laughs> and it just doesn't feel right. And the analogy I use for non-gun people, you everybody drives a car, we all know how to drive a car, right? 
If you were reading a scene where somebody went out to get in their car and they opened the trunk and they crawled through the trunk into the, into the driver's <laughs> seat and drove away, you'd be like, what? And it would kick you right out of the store, right? Same thing with guns. So when you hear the guy pull his, you know, he dramatically, cock, he dramatically cocks the hammer on his block, all the gun, and three non-gun people, blocks don't have hammers, all the gun, all the gun people are like, oh, what the hell? And it's kicked out. The worst thing you can do to a reader is kick him out of the immersion. Okay? Anytime you get the reader bored or confused, you have failed. All right? So the most important thing is keep the guys engaged, keep them focused, don't screw up the gun stuff. So do enough research to fake it, uh, get out there and actually shoot if you can. Now, people always ask me, where do I go for research? That's hard because, you know, the internet's there and it's got a lot of good technical information, but there's a lot of really bad information on the internet too especially from people who are self-professed gun people, or I've been shooting since I was a kid, okay? Just because somebody says something on the internet doesn't mean it's accurate. Uh, so try to find people who actually know what they're talking about if you have any gun questions. I'm in the thank yous of like a dozen different novels over the years because my non-gun people have come to me and asked me gun questions. You know, uh, Brandon Sanderson had a, uh, has got a thank you where he had to come to ask various gun questions because Brandon is not a gun person, right? And I was looking at what he had and I was like, no, dude, no, 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 that's bad. <laughs> don't do that. Trust me, don't do that. I have other authors. Um, I actually wound up in a Dan Wells novel as a character because um, he had this big action sequence where he had these corporate mercenaries doing this big takedown. And he's like, you know, trying to make sure I get all the stuff right. And so I was like, no, Dan, this is crap. You do this, 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 and this, with this, and this, and this, and this, and I did that, and give me that. And I, and I walked him through, and I restructured the whole action scene in a way that like made good tactical sense. And Dan's like, damn, can I just use you as the bad guy? And I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Extreme Makeover Apocalypse Edition, I am the corporate mercenary. Um, which is actually not that far off of my real life resume. Um, <laughs> so. On the gun stuff, just because it's on the internet doesn't necessarily mean it's true, so do enough work to make sure you can kind of confirm that. If you can find some people who are knowledgeable gun folks that can take you out and you can practice with them, that's great. If you can in your state, go shooting, go shooting. Go take a basic defensive pistol class. If you're not a gun person, um, most of these places will have some sort of loaner equipment. They'll get you some good basic safety instruction. They'll get you out in the range and get you going. Okay, it's not that complicated. Now, gun stuff in fiction. When you're writing this, like in nuts and bolts, first and most important thing, keep in mind the skill, knowledge, and abilities of your point of view character. So anytime you're writing a gun scene, it's all gonna be through this one point of view character, unless you're writing omniscient, which most of you aren't. You're not Frank Herbert, okay? Mm -hmm. Most of you guys are gonna have one point of view character, that your gun knowledge for that point of view character only needs to be as good as that point of view character's knowledge. If you have a character who has no knowledge of guns and they get a gun and they're in all of a sudden an action sequence, make them suck. If they don't know what they're doing, they don't know how to aim, they don't know how to shoot, make it be like, oh man, this is flippy and scary and loud, okay? And it's, I don't know, what kind is it? I don't know, it's black and silver, okay? If you have a point of view character that is an experienced professional gun person, that guy is going to know exactly what it is. Oh, this is a Smith & Wesson 5906. Wow, this is a third generation Smith. These are pretty cool. You don't see these every day anymore. Okay, It's going to be an entirely different level of knowledge base. Okay, So if you are coming at this from the perspective where you are not a gun person, but you're writing about like a bunch of Navy SEALs, you've got a lot more work to do to make that good. If it's kind of, you know, one of those things where they're not that knowledgeable, you don't have to do as much. It just needs to be convincing, okay? A lot of times you guys, as the author, you will know more than the character. That's perfect. Um, we do, we like to joke about Buffy the Vampire Slayer Syndrome. You guys know, you ever heard of that? Okay, so Buffy the Vampire Slayer Syndrome is in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you can take any schlub high school student and tell them that monsters are real, and five minutes later, they are kung fu fighting vampires. <laughs> More TV show than movie, okay? But you guys see what I'm saying, right? Guns take time to learn. They take training, they take practice. And so if you're writing a character that is new, they're not just gonna pick up a gun and just be 
proficient and smart and sharp and knew exactly what they're doing. Their manipulations are going to suck. If you're writing a character that is a legit badass, it's going to be smooth. They're going to know what they're doing. Okay? Like you're talking about, you're writing espionage. I mean, if you're writing a guy who, you know, like you saw this in the Tom Clancy writing the Jack Ryan series. Jack Ryan started out as a Marine, but he was an analyst, so he was kind of like lower level. And then you get him out there with Mr. Clark and Domingo Chavez, and they're just total badasses who know their stuff. See, that's, so that's what I'm talking about, point of view. Now, some nitpicky gun stuff on that. Uh, you guys need to realize if everything you know from television about firearms is wrong. Okay, if it's on TV about guns, it's probably wrong. And now this is going to come back to, like I talk about point of view characters, this is going to come back to your genre and how realistic what you are trying to write is. If you are writing something that's not super grounded in reality and it's a little more fluffy, it doesn't need to be perfectly accurate. If you are writing a techno thriller, it needs to be hyper accurate. If you're writing a superhero book, you can, you can vary that. Look like it's like hard magic, it's super gritty. But if you're writing something a little more fluffy, you don't have to. And so you need to kind of take that into perspective. So for example, uh, we'll talk about wound ballistics a little bit. When the human body gets hit by a bullet, it does certain things. And different kind of bullets do different kind of things. If you are writing My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, okay, you're probably not gonna describe the bone shattering effects and <laughs> hydrostatic shock and secondary wound channels, okay? Yeah. If you're writing Monster Hunter, it's going to be like blood, gore, and brains flying, and bone shards. So it's so very much different. Okay, so keep that in mind, too. If you're writing Magic Princess Adventure Time, and all of a sudden you get to the blood and guts, it's going to kick your readers out, because that is not what they signed up for. Okay, so keep that in mind, too. Now, on wound ballistics, in real life, human beings don't have hit points. They have blood pressure. Okay. In the movies, <clears throat> you know, guys get shot all the time and they walk it off, okay? In real life, you don't really walk off getting shot. Um, and there's these certain things in movies like where they, you get shot right here in the shoulder. It's like the best place to shoot somebody because yeah. there's absolutely nothing vital there. And the bullet just goes through and you can grimace and then kind of like, you know, run through the rest of the movie with a little band-aid stuck on it. No. <laughs> there's, a, there's an artery through here that's about the size of your thumb, okay? And if that's severed, you are... Uh, sorry, I shouldn't swear. This would be a screw. Um, you're screwed, okay? Um, so, so if you want to write gritty, realistic gunfight stuff, you need to look up... Uh, just Google wound ballistics. Uh, and if you, can, you can just even do an image search on this if you have a strong stomach. I'm not going to tell you guys to do this. Now, I, uh, many years ago, I took a wound ballistics class uh, put on by the Department of Homeland Security guys, where it's eight hours of us looking at people who'd been shot by pistol bullets, and then rifle bullets, and we took a lunch break, and then we came back and did shotguns. Yeah. <laughs> Worst class I've ever had. <laughs> um, okay, but we need to understand, like, so what pistol bullets really do in real life is they basically poke a hole in the human body. It's a long-range uh, hole puncher, okay? You guys have all heard of hollow point bullets, right? So a hollow point, all a hollow point is designed to do is to expand on impact, so it makes a little bit bigger hole. But mostly pistol bullets just kind of go thud. You guys have all seen the movies where somebody gets shot with a pistol and they dramatically fly back. People don't dramatically fly back when hit with pistol bullets. Pistols just don't have that much energy, they're just gonna poke a hole. What gets you is they poke a hole in your body, which causes damage to your organs and loss of blood pressure, okay? Now, rifle bullets are going a lot faster. And you'll see this in the movies all the time too, where somebody will have a rifle and they'll shoot somebody and the guy will you know, grimace and shrug it off. Now, rifle bullets are going really fast. When a rifle bullet hits the human body, it does a lot more damage. If it hits the bone, it tends to kind of go, all right? So, and then shotguns, you guys are writing shotguns. Once again, a shotgun is not gonna pick up a human being and throw them. But when a human being gets hit with a shotgun, it's usually a pretty dramatic re reaction, mostly because of the oh shit uh, factor. Um, that said, shotguns use different kind of ammo. Bird, you guys will hold bird shot, right? Mm -hmm. Bird shot's little tiny pellets. Um, and those against a human being don't do much if you're very far away. Like from here to here, you get shot with bird shot, it's gonna blow a big hole in you because it's not even really left. Uh, it's just gonna be about like this big. So it's all gonna hit you at once. Usually when you guys are writing gunfight scenes involving shotguns, it's gonna be like buckshot. Uh, buckshot is usually nine to 12 pellets, so lead about yay big. 
So what happens is when you shoot a human being with that, it's like shooting with a pistol nine times once. It really screws you up. 25 yards, 35 yards, and well, 35 with like like good like flight control buckshot. That is devastating. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you're writing this stuff. In the movies, guys get shot in the leg all the time, and they just kind of limp. Now, theoretically, if the bullet just goes through a fleshy bit, that is possible. If it hits the bone, no. Okay, if it hits an artery, no. Um, but all this stuff is stuff that you guys can get into the books to make it more visceral and more interesting. Also, taking a class on on treating gunshot wounds makes for really good scenes too. Um, I've, I've actually got, yeah, I've done a lot of medic characters in different books because you want to talk about it's like tension. That's some good tense scenes. Um, so once again, when I talk about like, human beings don't have hit points, they have, they have uh, blood pressure. Keep that in mind. So if you're writing realistic, that's how guns actually work. Rifles are way more devastating than the pistols. It's all about where you get hit and none of them are magic, okay? So if it goes through just a fleshy bit, it's just gonna go through a fleshy bit and not do a lot. If it hits something vital, you're gonna have more trouble. But like in the United States of America, uh, statistically, if you get shot in the torso with a handgun, you've got about a, I think it's, uh, last time I looked, it was like 85, 87, something like percent chance of survival. Because they're gonna take you to the hospital, they're gonna stop and you're gonna be okay. If you get hit with the rifle in the chest, that drops to, I wanna say is like 20%. And if you get hit with like a shotgun or buckshot within like 20 yards, that drops to like single digits. Okay, so it just kind of depends on what it is. Rifles come in very big to very small. Okay, there's a lot of myths out there on the internet. You will not get killed by a bullet passing close to you. There's this thing where like the 50, the 50 BMG is so powerful that if it, if it just barely misses you, you'll die from the shock wave. No, that's the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> But if you go, once again, if you get your gun information off the internet, there's a lot of stupid crap like that. However, if you're writing a really dumb character, don't be afraid to have your really dumb characters have bad ideas about guns, because that's realistic and it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> I've used that in books. We've had, I had one, one uh, my thriller series, uh, Dead Six, we had one character who's kind of a computer nerd and uh, just like the worst character ever, and every, all his gun knowledge came from video games. And so we had a great deal of fun with that. Because the guy was just, like, awful. Um, note on that, uh, there's what's called cover and there's what's called concealment. Uh, this is a huge one. Bullets poke holes, okay? In a lot of fiction, somebody will hide behind something and it'll just stop bullets. Like, if we were going to have a gunfight in this room, I could dramatically flip this table over and hide behind it. And your bullets would just spang off, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, realistically, bullets penetrate a lot more than you think. Um, so if you're writing something, basically if you can hide behind something and it doesn't stop bullets, that's considered concealment. You're hiding the body from being shot, but it's not going to stop the bullets if they shoot at the target. Don't be afraid to use your characters that have that knowledge. So if the bad guy is hiding behind the car door, you know, he just opens the door in the car and he's hiding behind it, just light that door up, okay? I mean, unless it hits the, uh, the window roll up and down mechanism, that's about the only thing in there that's going to stop the bullet, okay? So... On that, uh, that's the other thing. The TV violates that all the time. You see people hiding behind like pieces of drywall. Couch. And, you know, what? Couch. Couch. Oh, that's one. You just jump over the couch, and the bad guy's just spraying it with his Uzi. <laughs> None of those bullets go through that couch. So apparently, that couch is made out of Kevlar. They did that in Sarah Connor Chronicles when they showed later. <laughs> well, see, that works. Now, if you have steel couches, okay, that's fair. That's fair. He treated steel couches. You're good to go. Um, but, yeah, bullets penetrate quite a bit, quite more than people realize, uh, especially rifle bullets that are designed to penetrate. Um, you guys have all heard the term armor piercing. I mentioned hollow points earlier. Armor piercing is kind of the opposite idea because a hollow point is designed to open up and make a bigger wound channel. A hollow point is pointy and hard. And its job is to poke a deeper hole. That comes into effect when you're trying to shoot through cover. Right? You're trying to shoot through more material. Um, that would be what's considered armor piercing. Uh, I'll get to questions today. It was a comment, actually. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on a hollow point, especially hydroshock, I discovered, uh, actually, a friend of mine did by accident, that it doesn't penetrate through cinder block. Oh, no, cinder block's actually shot. Uh, I'll tell you, cinder, cinder blocks are interesting. Cinder blocks will actually stop quite a bit of uh, gunfire. If you've ever gone to what's called a shoot house, which would be like a tray, like a 360 degree 
training environment for like SWAT teams and that kind of thing. So basically they'll, they'll have like an enclosure and they'll have uh, an interior building set up. Usually it's cinder block construction because you can hit cinder block several times with smaller caliber guns and they'll hold up pretty good, especially if they're stacked on top of each other. Um, like, but if you hit cinder blocks with like big rifle bullets, it's just going to pulverize them in short order. 223 will do it. Yeah, 223 will wreck cinder blocks pretty fast. They'll, they'll stop with 45 HCP. Yeah. Uh, if you ever go in, on the inside, not one on the outside of my house. Yeah, if you go, if you go into a shoot house, you can always tell the areas where guys screwed up. Like you guys, brother, you, not me. Oh yeah, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Those of you who've been in a shoot house, you know what I mean. And you go in the shoot house, and you're like, this is the clearing barrel, and this are, and this is we don't shoot this direction. There's like the gouges. You're like, <laughs> okay. Oh, on that note, characters. If your character knows what they're doing, look up the four rules of gun safety and have your character obey them. Nothing shows proficiency of a character more than obeying the basic rules of gun safety. And the four rules are um, keep your finger off the trigger. I'm going to go real fast here. Uh, always treat all guns as if they're loaded. Um, keep your muzzle in a safe direction. And never let, uh, or, or then um, know your target and its environment and like what's behind it. So a character who's supposed to be a proficient gun professional, they're gonna walk around, if the gun is in their hand, their finger is going to be indexed somewhere outside of the trigger guard, usually on some feature of the gun they can feel. Like honestly, most guys who do this a lot, we'll have, you'll see our fingers are kind of like hyper extended up onto like the ejection port, okay? That way we know we have a positive index that our fingers away from the trigger. You see TV all the time, you know, the mm -hmm. cop is posing, Yes. Okay, that's just stupid. All right. Now, if you want to have a stupid character who doesn't know what they're doing, have them walking around with their finger on the trigger. The thing about walking around with their finger on the trigger is, you know, you slip, you fall, you trip. Uh, you have a, sh a startle. Re what happens when you have a startle reaction? Yeah, that's bad. Okay. When your trigger finger does that. Uh, sympathetic muscle reflex. Yeah. yeah. If one hand is doing one thing, your other hand actually wants to do that too. So if you're doing something, you're, you're wrestling a guy to get the cuffs on him or whatever, and your other hand has the finger on the trigger, you know, bad, okay, negligent discharge. So, proficient characters are going to know those rules and obey them. Now, if you are writing time period specific, keep in mind those four rules of gun safety are more of a modern invention. Those really didn't start to get popular until the 1950s. Uh, before that, it would vary, okay, from well, place to place. Discharges in the Old West. Well, it wasn't, it was, back in the old days, it was really common like you would be like, and you'd see this from like professional instructors, like you keep your trigger, you keep your finger on the trigger because you're ready. <laughs> we didn't understand a lot of stuff back then, but it wasn't really until post World War II, is it Colonel Jeff Cooper, that they really started pressing, you know, the modern what we consider the modern rules of gun safety. Okay, um, your characters, um, it's it's going to depend a lot on what you're doing with them and their and their knowledge. But if you're writing John Wick. Obviously, you're coming at it with a much different level of, of comfort in handling skill. If your characters are less familiar with guns, they're going to be a little more hesitant. Um, it's actually good for people who, if, if they don't know what they're doing and they're new to this, they're going to be kind of timid. They're going to be kind of scared. I've taught a lot of people, and uh, you know, if you're new, you're going to be timid. The most dangerous thing in the world, though, is someone who's new and doesn't think they are, or somebody who's new and inexperienced who's not timid. Okay, so if you want to write a gross, disgusting, negligent discharge scene, <laughs> that's the kind of person you're talking about. Okay, so safety, uh, proficiency, handling. Uh, we've talked a little bit about um, stuff like um, uh, the different weapon types. When you are writing about this stuff, there's a, there's a tendency to want to info dump. And I do this a lot, like in the Monster Hunter series, because it's very gun nutty. I up the gun nuttiness. I have big info dumpy bits about the guns, especially the first book, like I said, of self-published to gun people. Don't info dump more than your uh, audience likes, okay? So whatever genre you're writing in, uh, keep it appropriate as far as the gun nuttiness. Especially, like a lot of times I can tell I'm reading a book and I can tell that that author just went out to Wikipedia and looked up the, the thing that they get. Well, I'm carrying a such and such, which was invented in 1987 by so and so. <laughs> no one talks that way, okay? Um, so, so keep that in mind. Info dump only with what you is a what is appropriate. So, I'm writing Monster Hunter. My main character is a super hardcore gun net, 
and I'm writing this for an audience of gun nuts. So in the first book, every time he gets a new gun, he very excitedly goes over everything on it. Okay, and it's like a paragraph of info dump, which for the series works great. In fact, in the later books in the series, I didn't do that as much because I went from self-published to on gun forums to a worldwide audience, so I, I took down the gun nuttiness quite a bit. And then somebody in one of the one of my reviews like whined about it or like complained about like I was still too gun nutty. So in like the eighth book, I actually went back and put for just for old time's sake, the guy got a new sniper rifle. So I put like a three paragraph description <laughs> just to spite this one reviewer. He's like, this is just gun porn. I was like, oh, I'll show you gun porn. <laughs> in fact, I got a free sniper rifle out of it because <laughs> JP Enterprise gave me a free gun for the for the no advertising. Way. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of cool. Once you sell enough books, you will get free guns from gun companies. It's, uh, but, but yeah, you, you got to work up to that. Um, now, if the, uh, let's see. Uh, let me check my notes real fast. I'm trying to remember if I hit all the stuff that I really wanted to get that was super pertinent here. Okay, I think I've hit all the stuff that's really super pertinent. So at this point, if anybody has any gun-specific questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, so he had one first, I'll get you. Go I was ahead. just going to say, would you mind covering for the group the difference between single action, double action? Sure thing. That's a good one. Okay. Um, when you are writing your basic guns, there are, uh, if you use this, this applies to handguns. There's a few different types of handguns nowadays. Um, if you're writing modern stuff, a single action gun is a gun that for it to operate, the hammer is already cocked. Okay, the hammer must be cocked before the gun can be fired. Usually you would carry that gun with a hammer cock and some sort of safety device applied. The most common gun that's like that in the world today that you would come across is what's called a 1911, the Colt 1911 or one of the other brands, okay? Um, not as common as it used to be. If you're riding something in the 1980s, that is, or the 1970s, that's the gun that they're probably gonna have if they have a semi-automatic handgun. Next type is what's called double action. Double action, when you pull the trigger, it will cock the hammer and then fire the gun. Okay, so the, the trigger pull is heavier. Um, most revolvers are what's called double action. And so your double action revolver, like Dirty Harry, he's using a for the you know, Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum. That's a double action revolver. Longer, heavier trigger pull, boom. Okay. Now this does get a little complicated because you have also you, where you can cock those and then have a single action trigger mm -hmm. pull this lighter. Unless you're getting really gun nutty or writing Dirty Harry, you're probably not gonna do that. <coughs> This is what we call the traditional double action or regular double action semi-auto. That's your first shot's gonna be that long and heavy shot. But when the slide reciprocates, the hammer stays back and all your other shots are shorter and lighter. Most common guns you'll see like that. It'd be like for many years we used the Beretta M9, was the military sidearm. That's that kind of gun, okay? And then the last type, which is the most common type of gun today, a pistol, is what's called striker fired. And that's basically your Glocks and all the other guns that are like that. The trigger pull is consistent. It uses an internal mechanism where it's partially cocked, basically. You pull the trigger and that cocks it the rest of the way and fires it. It tends to be a shorter, lighter trigger. Those guns usually don't have manual safeties. If you ever have a manual safety on a gun, just check the internet and make sure that gun does actually have it. That's what we're joking about. People taking the safeties off of their Glocks dramatically in pop novels. It happens all the time. So Glocks don't have safeties and so you just sound stupid to all the gun people. Okay, but if you have a 1911 and the guy takes the safety off the gun, well, yes, that's correct, you would. Um, there's a lot of good YouTube videos out there where you can watch different types of shooting with different types of guns, and that's nice, but none of them are as good as actually going out and going hands-on with different types of firearms. Could you address the... Oh, I, she actually, she oh, was sorry. next, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, let me get her in the... Yes, um, so writing urban fantasy or other uh, genres where there's going to be big, bad, magical monsters. Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you balance the monsters and the guns in a way that's satisfying for the audience so they can still be big, bad, but guns aren't nullified? Yeah, so like, okay, so Monster Hunter, that, that question is my bread and butter. And there's a couple different ways to do this. And the whole, where Monster Hunter came from originally was uh, a bunch of internet gun nuts making jokes about horror movies and how horror movies would be over really fast if they starred our people. So that's where it comes from. So my solution to this, to keep to have an actual big dramatic arc, was either more monsters or really tough monsters you had to shoot a lot or with really big things. There's a million different ways you can tackle this. There's not really a right way. Like I said, I, I, I'm eight, eight, eight books into the series and like three spinoffs and an anthology, okay? So 
We've had really gigantic monsters requiring very, very large guns or large amounts of ordnance. We've had swarms of smaller monsters. We've had you know everything from slow-moving zombies to fast things to things that regenerate hyper fast. Uh, it all just whatever for dramatic effect. We've gone to like different types of ammunition, like obviously like silver bullets for werewolves. Um, which do some research on that before you just write silver bullets because you know I had to do it. Silver silver doesn't work that good in real life. Okay, so you got to get a work around that. Well, you got to be real. <laughs> Ballistically in real life, not wound chant. I mean, I'm talking. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, yeah, so there's a million different ways you can tackle that. <clears throat> like we had a fight scene against a dragon. Uh, we wound up using a, a 20 millimeter cannon to, to have effect on it. Uh, and so you just step, and that, that, sometimes you get to stuff where there's guns that I have never shot, and I am, a, I am about as gun nutty as you can get, and there's points where I am having to go do research or call in favors from friends of mine to get a hold of something. Um, because it's, it, like I, I used to do this for a living, so I've had to go pretty obscure stuff. Um, if you start getting into ordnance and that kind of, you know, if you're getting into ex, like explosives, that's a whole different thing. That's when you need to seek out guys that are bomb people uh, one of my best friends is an EOD tech. Uh, Mike Cooper is a science fiction author, great writer. Uh, but Mike, Mike was EOD, uh, and that's what he did: was diffuse bombs for a living. And so, anytime I have a bomb thing, I would bounce it off Mike. On that note, real there, if you uh, if you can get amongst your alpha readers, amongst your proofreaders, somebody who actually legit knows their crap about firearms, <clears throat> you may not necessarily want their feedback on like you know, dialogue or pacing, but if you can get the gun nut to be like, yeah, no, that's stupid, and, and you're, then then go check that. But just because one person thinks it wrong, they, they might just not know what they're talking about. But just make sure you, you know, run your stuff past specific people. I, I like, there's certain subjects I don't know anything about, like aviation, I know nothing about airplanes. So if I have a scene involving an airplane, I'm gonna get somebody who knows that airplane and have them look at it to make sure I don't screw it up. So, hope that, hope that works. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, we addressed the uh, issue of suppressors. Oh, and, suppressors. And the, the actual effect they have on the oh. discharge of fire. This is really interesting. Okay, so movies, you guys all know what suppressors are, right? Or silencers. Uh, and back when I was coming up, we weren't allowed to call them silencers. We all called them suppressors. That was like the official thing. And then we were like, nah, just call them silencers. <laughs> so it's fine. You can call them whatever. Um, those are basically gun mufflers, all right? They're the. You know the thing that you see in the Hitman movie where they dramatically screw it onto the muzzle? <laughs> okay, so they do actually thread on, but you're not usually gonna do that right before you shoot the guy. It's gonna be on there already. Um, the way suppressors work is when a gun is fired, the boom that you hear is as that bullet is leaving the gun, the expanding gases, these hot gases, escape and expand in the atmosphere, and that's what you hear is the big boom. Okay, now the bullet will also make a supersonic noise if it's going faster than the speed of sound. Actually, that supersonic noise isn't that loud. And it's actually louder downrange going past you than it is uh, being the person who shot it. Now what a suppressor does is it's basically a tube that has a series of baffles in it, just like a muffler on a car. So there's expanding gases instead of going like this, go into the tube and just kind of go and they get stuck. And it slows them down. So what happens is energy that would be released as sound is now trapped and turns into heat. So one thing people don't realize, uh, suppressors get really hot really fast, like really hot really fast. Uh, they will jump about, depending on the material and uh, how hot the ammunition is, they'll jump three to seven degrees per shot, okay? So if you are rocking on like, a, you, you, you can like watch videos on the internet where somebody has a belt-fed machine gun, like a 240 with a suppressor on it, and they will shoot it until the suppressor melts. <laughs> it doesn't take that long. Uh, they get really, really hot. I've actually set, uh, I've unwittingly set um, cases, gun cases, foam fabric gun cases on fire. Uh, because I'd be shooting, I would set the gun down on the case, and I'd come back and it was smoldering, and the foam had melted onto my suppressor. Uh, also, they're, they're called cans. You'll hear us call them cans a lot. Um, this kind of terminology. But sound-wise, what this sounds like, to put this in perspective, the best thing to do is actually hear this, if you can, to describe it. But a 9 millimeter suppressed, it's not like the movies where it's just and the guy 15 feet, in here. so as the sentry gets shot and the other dude doesn't hear it, no, that's not realistic unless you're using really, really quiet ammunition. We'll talk about that. 
Uh, 90 millimeter sounds like take a big book, take a hardcover book, open it, slam it. That's about what it sounds like. So it's thump. That's what a 9 millimeter sounds like. The bullet actually hitting the target is a little louder because it usually goes whomp. Okay? Now, like a 45 suppressed, take that same book and on a hard floor and go boom. That's about what it sounds like. That said, it's still a lot nicer and it doesn't actually damage your eardrums. That's really what suppressors are for, is not destroying your hearing. And you can be shooting and talking to the guy next to you, and it's fine. As opposed to everybody being deaf and having tinnitus for the rest of their life. Um, <coughs> rifles, uh, similar, kind of a, like a 5.56 with a, with a can on it. It's going to depend on the barrel length. But it's more of a chuff, is what it sounds like. Kind of, you know, is what it, And then the supersonic noise as it goes past you is, uh, it, it's kind of hard. It sounds like angry beats. Hmm. Is what is what bullets, you know, depending on how fast it's going, makes that make sense. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you want to hear what that sounds like, go to a rifle range that has what's called a pit. A pit is where there's a thing down range, it's like a trench, and there's somebody who can operate the target stands, and that's about it, the safest way that you can actually get close to the receiving end of gunfire without actually being shot at, which is stupid and. I want you guys to do research, but don't be stupid. <laughs> don't actually, hey dude, just shoot it past my head. No, don't do that. That's bad. I, and yeah, I'm on video saying don't do that. Okay. Wink, wink. But if, yeah, no, 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 don't wink, wink. But if you work the piss at a rifle range, what's happening is the targets are above your head because you're in a trench and you're the guy lifting the targets and setting up new targets because they're competing. And you'll hear the bullet going a couple feet above your head. And it sounds like angry beats. Now, if you ever get shot at an accident, then you're, you know, you're out in the woods and you, it's deer season, and you hear the, Whoa! yeah, that's drunk moron, <laughs> and it's time to get out of here, okay? Um, yeah, in the back there. Basic training works really well for that too. Oh yeah, because they do the, they do the, the, the crawl with the. Yeah, it's just going over your head. And yep. That's I've not done that. I am a cake eating civilian. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got a ton of questions. All right, let me, uh, I'll try to get, yes, right here. Uh, what about those that are hearing impaired? How would that training be for them versus someone who isn't? Okay, so on the hearing, okay, so basically, if you are if you are hearing impaired, it's just gonna sound different to you based upon whatever your level of hearing damage is. That said, anybody who shoots without hearing protection is going to get hearing damage. Uh, people don't realize about hearing damage is it's permanent and it's cumulative. So the more you're exposed to noises over a certain decibel range, the more it's gonna damage your ears. So in the movies, guys will like get into gunfights like in a concrete hallway. <laughs> and then three minutes later, they're having a conversation. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's okay, the, the mo actually the most realistic TV show ever about hearing damage is Archer. <laughs> For real. Mom. Mom. Yeah, well that's, that is actually the only show I know of that's really good. Now what happens, is um, any noise that makes your ears ring has actually done permanent damage. Mm -hmm. So anytime you, you've heard like a really loud noise and your ears are ringing upward, that's the little hairs in your ears dying and they don't come back. So if you have a character that gets into gunfights constantly with unsuppressed firearms, he's gonna have muffed up here. Um, that's like, like um, every vet I know has some percentile disability related to loud noises. Uh, and tonight, are you guys especially? Our, uh, our, oh man, every artillery guy I know is deaf. Um, and the thing is, too, like, like I was a professional firearms instructor for many, many years. I, I did this for or ten years. I was at the range, a you know, several times a week, all weekend long. And I would be, I was religious about wearing hearing protection. Um, but even then, it just takes every now and then you'll screw up and you'll think the range is closed. You call range closed. You take yours off. The guy next to you touches off something. You're like, ah. And you got that noise and you lost a range of hearing. And so, and, and that's not just, I mean, it's anything. So rock concerts will do this to you too. If you work around heavy machinery, it's all the same thing. It's that cumulative noise damage will make you deaf. So yeah, but you, if you have characters shooting good, I see this all the time in like romantic comedies and cop shows. They'll be at the range having a conversation with no hearing protection on and they're just shooting guns. And it's like, these are the stupidest people in the world uh, I mean, they did that yeah, on Castle. On, you didn't have any conversation either, though. Yeah, they, 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 they did that on like, Castle. Also, like, hearing protection, there's a thing called electronic. If you want your characters to wear hearing protection, but be able to have a conversation still, get what's called um, electronic hearing protection. They're basically noise-canceling earmuffs. 
So they have a microphone in them. You turn them up to the volume you want. You can hear everything just fine. When there's a gunshot, it cuts out. I mean, your hearers are protected, but the microphone cuts out. So you don't actually, it just, it's muffled. Um, so like everybody who's a professional gun nut, like you're teaching for a living, you will have electronic muffs. Uh, if you take classes, you will have electronic muffs. They are worth their weight in gold. They're only like 75 bucks for a basic, basic pair. Amazing though. Totally recommend it. Uh, I got a ton of questions. I'm going to try to go back and I'll come to you guys here in front here. I'm sorry, Katie, what? Sorry, have a character that is an assassin. Okay. So if they're trying to shoot long range, what's the best time of gun for them to do? Oh, long range, okay. Long range shooting is a whole different uh, thing. When you say long range, <clears throat> it's gonna kind of depend because a lot of people think long range is over 100 yards. But um, if you are a precision rifle shooter, you can go 1,000 yards plus. In fact, we have what's called PRS, uh, if you want to see what people can really do, look up PRS uh, just on the internet, on YouTube. It's precision rifle shooting. It's a, it's a, it's a competition where they will shoot 1,000 to 1,500 yards uh, from various field positions. Now, for long-range shooting, this is where you get into a term, uh, you'll hear a lot, weaponized math. Because this actually gets gone. I've taken, I've taken a precision rifle class. I've taken a sniper class. I was terrible at it. There's a reason I wear glasses now. Uh, I was the worst spotter ever is actually what one of the things that finally got me to get glasses. I mean, I felt really bad for the guy that I was spotting for because I couldn't see crap. Um, precision rifle shooting. When the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, it's immediately going to start to go downward because of gravity. Okay. So if you want to get it out there further, you've got to angle your barrel up and lob the bullet like this. It's going to be on a trajectory, ballistic trajectory. So you're gonna put a scope on this gun so you can magnify and see further. And that scope's gonna be angled too. And it's gonna have adjustments in it where you can click the uh, reticle up and down. Okay, and left and right also for wind. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna see this target, like say it's a thousand yards away, depending on the type of bullet you are shooting, that bullet could drop, you know, 28 feet from where you originally fired. So you are basically aiming 28 feet above it. Okay, now how you do this, um, actually you can look this up on the internet too, look up ballistic calculator. There are free ballistic calculators on the internet and you can like put in a certain kind of rifle, uh, a certain kind of barrel length, it'll have the caliber of rifle, have the cartridge, uh, it'd be very complicated and it will tell you how many clicks you would put on what kind of scope to, to put that reticle where you want it to launch it in. Now that's just, the trajectory. The other hard part for distance, and this is where your professional snipers, your professional precision riflemen, it's reading the wind. Because the wind can change three or four times over the distance that bullet is traveling. So this gets very complicated. Uh, so there's actually, it's, it, that, so the, the first part is the math part. The second part is the magic part, where you are judging the wind, and that's telling you how much right or left you're gonna have to hold. And so you would then adjust your scope for that and put it on, okay? And I, I, I took a class um, from a guy, he was a, he was a army sniper, he was a, he was a Green Beret, Special Forces guy. And me and my spotter did this thing where we were shooting from 500 to 1200 yards. We had six targets spread out. We had to spot the target. It was out in the desert in New Mexico. The targets were only about 18 inches. We'd have to spot the target, range it, dial the scope in, shoot, until we hit the target, switch to the next one, and see how long we get from 500 to 1200 yards. And it took me, my partner was awful because I was his spotter, so I was like the shittiest spotter ever and I feel bad, okay? But I, I did it in like just under two minutes. And I was feeling pretty badass, right? So this guy who's the green bray, the guy who's the instructor, sits down and he does it. And he did the whole thing, him and his spotter, they cleared it in like 30 seconds. So a guy that knows what they're doing, so this is somebody like, like if you're writing a professional assassin um, who has put in the time, knows their gun, knows their load, knows how to read the wind, has a good scope, good rifle, they can do stuff that will blow your mind. <laughs> yeah, it'll blow your mind out the back of your mind. Um, yeah, no, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's an area that I, I, I dabbled in and I'm not that good at. It's, it's, a, it's an art. The guys that are good at that, it's, it's rather amazing to see. But there are some really, like I said, look up PRS on the internet. There's a lot of different sniper rifles to choose from. 
Um, most of them are going to be in 308, which is 762 by 51, or now like 665 uh, Creedmoor is the other one that's really super popular. Or there's really big ones like 338 Lapua. Um, and it'll either be a bolt action rifle or a semi automatic rifle, depending on what you're doing. So, okay, uh, he had one back here, then I'll come back to you guys up here. Actually, yeah. just two quick ones. One, is there a better ready reference out there than the DA Pan 385 for penetration? I'm sorry, well, the better reference in who? Then the DA Pan 385-63, the range safety manual by the Army that includes penetrating power as well as your ranges and capabilities. I don't know. Most of my knowledge of penetration has come from just shooting various things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was a civilian, so I was a military contractor, but I, I never, yeah, so yeah. no idea on that. So that's also your range safety manual, so it tells you how to build STZs and things like that. It is accessible to everyone. Yeah. So, but, okay. And then the second one is, you talked about the like rifles, pistols, that, how would you, what would you change as far as your less than lethal munitions? Oh, okay, less than lethal is a little bit different. Um, normally, for those of you guys that don't know, it's some sort of projectile weapon that's gonna be fired at somebody, but the goal is not to kill them, the goal is to hurt them through comply, you know, hurt them until they comply. That's me, like the things you usually see in the uh, on TV will be things like bean bags, or bean bag rounds, or baton rounds. Um, normally those are going to be fired through either a weapon that's designed specifically only to fire that kind of thing, like a 37 millimeter launcher. You ever see those big things look like giant grenade launcher with a big rotary, you know, a bunch of... Okay, there's two kinds. There's those that are 37 millimeter, which are designed to fire big baton rounds, and there's that are designed to fire 40 millimeter, which are fuck you and everyone next to you. Okay, those, are the, <laughs> those are the explosive ones. Um, but a baton round is just basically usually a piece of nylon uh, I don't remember the, how fast they're going, but it bloop and it flies over there and just whacks you. And it's like getting hit with a fastball. All right, it just sucks. Um, then they have bean bags. Usually, you're fired out of a 12 gauge shell. And you'll notice cops, like on this, they'll, they'll get out a shotgun. If the shotgun is normal colored, and it, or it's uh, it's got like a wood stock or a plastic you know stock on it, that's the normal shotgun. That's loaded with buckshot, right? If they get a shotgun that is bright green or bright orange. That is the less lethal shotgun. That's the shotgun that's loaded with bean bags. Okay, the color is going to depend on the department, uh, and usually you don't mix the two. You don't put bean bags in your regular shotgun. You can. There's nothing to stop you, except the problem is like I'm going to bean bag this non-compliant suspect. Boom! Oh, oh shit! Because <laughs> that's lost time. Right? So, so that's why they have the green shotgun. Or the now, what happens though in real life usually is because this is based on pain compliance. If the guy is not feeling compliant, there's almost always when they use this kind of thing. There's like a, one cop with a real gun and one cop with the the bean bag gun, and they do that specifically because if Plan A doesn't work, Plan B is ready. Okay, but you don't usually mix and match munitions in one gun because that is a disaster waiting to happen. If anybody tells you they do that, they're an idiot, and it's just a matter of time before they, they kill somebody on accident. Um, then there's tasers. Okay, so uh, you guys have all seen tasers in the movies? All right, this is one that gets my grinds my gears. Okay, there's two types of things that are referred to as tasers. The first one is the little stabby one, that's the two little prongs, and they make the cool little crackle. And you guys ever notice in the movies they use that, they'll come up and they'll zap a dude, and he'll fall over unconscious, huh. and they can kidnap him? No. Bullshit, that's not what it does. Those little tasers, what they actually do is they just shock the snot out of you, and they burn you, and they hurt. It feels like being pinched with a red-hot pair of pliers. Do they render you unconscious? No, not at all, it just hurts. In fact, at the gun store, we used to have these and we would play tag with them. Because <laughs> we had a bunch of hyper-masculine, you know, I had a bunch of 20-year-old former Marines and former Rangers, and they'd be out there in the parking lot zapping each other. And I was the guy that did the accounting, so I was like, yeah, hey, y'all have fun. No, but I have been shocked with these things. And they hurt like the Dickens. Like I said, it's a red-hot pair of pliers. But they don't render you unconscious. The render you unconscious thing is just a movie thing. Now there's what's called, they're also referred to as a taser, and it's actually a taser, the brand name, is the kind that they shoot and two little prongs shoot out on a wire, and they stick in you and they shock you. Now that one will actually immobilize you because what happens is when you get hit, your muscles kind of go Bleh! and you can't do anything as long as current is flowing through those wires. That's the ones they used on Rodney King. Yeah, now the thing is those work Sometimes, because what happens is you're getting zapped. While you're getting zapped, it works until one of the prongs fall out, 
or one of the little fragile wires break, okay? And then it's, you know, the circuit's not complete. Or if the dude is on some sort of neuro, I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a medical guy, so, you know, I'm not going to Dunning-Kruger myself on medical stuff, but there are certain drugs or psychological states where you zap a dude with that, and it ain't going to do nothing, okay? Or clothing. Or clothing, yeah, if you're wearing thick clothing. Basically, anything that will stop the prongs from going into your flesh, because it needs to, needs to cycle uh, the electricity through you, it ain't going to do anything. So you, it's not really gun stuff, but you will see that in the movies all the time. They're not magic. And a lot of people, too, if you start watching the news, people will be like, why didn't they taser that guy? Well, because that dude they, they didn't taser was in the process of stabbing someone with a butcher knife when they shot him with a real gun. If they took the time to taser him, the other dude's dying, and it may or may not work. So tasers are not magic. Uh, I had a couple up here first. Uh, go ahead, and then I'll do. Um, I, uh, I make um, audiobooks and audio dramas, I do a lot of sound effects and music, and I was wondering if there's any databases that you know of, of gun nuts that uh, record oh. all sorts of, you know, all sorts of different I don't sounds. actually know that. I know that there are, I know they exist. I've seen people talk about it, like like Hollywood sound guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know there are YouTube videos out there of people collecting those sounds, but as far as how to access those, I have no idea. Uh, speed, oh, okay. Well, all right. So, speed round, guys. <laughs> um, what is the procedure to take care of a person with a gunshot wound while the ambulance is coming? Okay, depends on where they get hit. Uh, so, our question is, how, what's the procedure to help someone with a gunshot wound uh, while the ambulance is coming? Basically, there's okay. Ten hour class compressed into one minute. <laughs> if they get hit in a limb, tourniquet, real tourniquet. Okay. In the movies, they just you know just put your belt on there. Uh, that doesn't work for crap, okay? Uh, it's got to actually be able to stop the blood flow. You want to use what's called a soft or a cat uh, tourniquet. Um, that's got a, some sort of windlass you can turn. I mean, you tighten it up, and then you crank the snot out of that. It'll stop blood. So limbs, tourniquet. Um, the, the joints, uh, I'm not a medical guy. If there's a medic in here, you're going you're gonna to get mad at me. But they, they pack that. They, they, they pack the seams. And if it's torso, usually they use what's called a chest seal. And so that is a basically a big ass bandage. All right, that's 10 hours of class in one minute. Um, <laughs> quick clot. Uh, quick clot is a material you can use, you pour into a wound and it's designed to kind of like, it like heats up and like basically, and it's not cauterized, but it like gels the area to, to stop the bleed. I've heard it works I don't know. I've never. I've used it in books because it sounded cool. But yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So when, when writing science fiction and or future tech, how do you make those future weapons feel real? Oh man, that's a whole. I've done that. I've done an hour long thing on that. Um, okay. So sci-fi weapons, guys. Sky's the limit. Okay. You can go freaking nuts with sci-fi weapons, and. What's going to come down to is just the flavor that you're going for, like the level of tech, how how you want it set up. And honestly, it's like you can really do all sorts of crazy stuff as long as you write it in a way that it sounds plausible to the reader. Um, be careful, though, because guns are still going to be guns. Weapons are still going to be weapons. Things are going to happen. Uh, I mean, guns break. Guns don't function. Guns overheat. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, be careful, because sometimes, like I'll see this in video games, guns are basically, they turn into magic wands, and they'll have like a, like, oh, this guy is wearing armor, so I must use armor piercing ammo, or this guy is not wearing armor, so I must use, you know, and they, they have like green or red, and you, know, you know. You can do pretty much whatever you want, just as long as you make it feel real and appropriate. Um, but make sure, when I say appropriate, make sure it makes sense for your setting. If everybody's got like a laser disintegrator mega blaster, you know, uh, one thing, okay, I love Dune. I love the movie Dune. I love the book Dune. I played the role playing game. However, in the Dune universe, there's this thing where if somebody has their, their energy shield and you shoot them with a laser gun, it causes a nuclear explosion. Okay, there's a problem with that in the, in the series. If you had it so that you could go down to Home Depot and buy two common items and put them together and make a nuclear weapon, Johnny School Shooter is going to do that all the time. I mean, in Dune, they're all like, oh, well, we wouldn't do that because the houses of the Longstrad would come and crush any house that did that. Well, I'm not worried about the house, dude. I'm worried about Johnny School Shooter. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, so just keep that kind of thing in mind. 
But then again, Frank Herbert just wanted to have badass sword fights, which is why we have Jason Momoa flying around killing dudes, and it's pretty badass, so I can't complain. Rule of cool. <laughs> um, okay, so we had... Uh, that, yes? Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a guy in Texas developing taser bullets. We fired out a normal gun. Do you know if that ever went anywhere? You no that? idea. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I, I, I got, when I got out of the gun business, I quit paying attention to everything. Because <laughs> I no longer had to pay attention. Um, oh, real fast, real fast I, I did bring one thing up with you that I just thought of that might actually be pertinent for you guys. <clears throat> malfunctions. I said weapons malfunction. Uh, guns malfunction, and this is an appropriate thing that does happen in real life. However, don't overuse it in your fiction because it's going to come across as as BS because guns don't malfunction that often. I see, I was reading, I won't name it because it was a terrible book and the author seems like a nice guy, but he had um, three different action sequences in the book where the hero has this, it was an MP5, which is actually a pretty reliable gun, right? So he had this MP5 submachine gun, but the gun would, or then at one point he had an HKP7, so you can tell this is a SEAL, okay, uh, from the 80s, and at one point he had an HKP7, these are all pretty reliable guns, but three times in the book he'd have the gun malfunction then he had to drop the gun and go hand-to-hand -hand combat against some dude. In one book? In one book. Three <laughs> times this happened. I counted. And the River Queen's not all her problems. No, first off, I'm like, take that MP5 to the armor and smack a bitch. And be like, dude! I mean, what the hell, man? Okay, so guns do malfunction. And actually, they don't malfunction that often. And if you're dealing with a professional shooter, someone who knows what they're doing, like your assassin or whatever, if your gun malfunctions, they're going to immediately clear that malfunction. And they're going to get back in action. Okay? Um, guns do break. But once again, not that often, okay? So you can use that as a dramatic device, device in your books, just don't dramatic device well, so too often. If it's a newbie, they might limp wrist it. That's yeah, there's actually, the there's, uh, most common malfunctions are not the gun's fault, it's the user's fault. Um, like if you're shooting a semi-automatic handgun, it's called limp wristing, and that's not a derogatory slur, that's literally what's happening. It's if you're holding a semi-automatic weapon, remember that slide has to move back and forth, has to reciprocate, it needs something solid to reciprocate this, but if your wrist is like this, what's going to happen is all that energy is going to get eaten up, and so the slide's not going to travel all the way back far enough to pick up, to eject around and pick up a new one. Okay? Oh, ejecting rounds is actually a really cool thing. Some autos eject the rounds dramatically, and they hit the ground. They do actually make a noise when they hit the ground. So they do actually make that tinkle noise like in the movies. That, that is real. Not that you can usually hear it, because you're like, boom, boom, boom. You're not hearing tinkle, tinkle. However, dramatically, shells on the ground is very it's cool, cool visual. They're like hell when they go down. Oh, they are hot. Okay, all gun people. We, we have we joke about what's called, let me show you the dance of my people. <laughs> That's when you're on the range, and there's guys next to you, and that one shell goes, and the dance of my people looks like this. <laughs> but the gun stays down range if you know what you're doing. The most dangerous thing in the world is the new guy. When that happens, and it's oh, because then as the instructor, my job is to be like, <laughs> I have done that more times than I have liked. Uh, back here, back. Well, there's a corollary to that dance, and that's the left handed woman with a right ejecting uh, rifle. Oh, yeah, and also, guys, too, remember, brass when it ejects is very fast, very hot. Women, when you go to the range, and we actually had a guy get shot in Utah because of this, do not wear a cleavage shirt. I'm dead serious. This is a range safety issue. We had a lady in an indoor range. She had the big uh, open shirt. <laughs> and a brass case landed in her bra, burned the crap out of her, and she turned, trying to get in, and the instructor tried to step in to stop the muzzle before she turned, and she fired into his leg in the range. <laughs> this is Salt Lake City, Utah. This happened at a, at a range we knew, and we're like, oof. Every instructor was like, oh, jeez. Yeah, bad. Don't... Yeah, don't do that. And don't wear sandals. I see people go to the range wearing sandals. This is a recipe for disaster. Okay, so back here. I just wanted to make a comment. A bigger gun is not necessarily louder. Uh, no, it's or not. Shooter. The biggest thing, it's honestly. Yeah, barrel length on a barrel. Barrel length on a gun is actually a huge thing. One of the guns that's really popular right now is what's considered AR-15 pistols. That's where you take an AR-15 that normally has a 16-inch barrel, most, most of the cartridges are designed for, but they cut the barrel down to 10 inches or 8 inches or even 6 inches, and it's a fireball generator, because most of that powder hasn't burned coming out loud as hell. 
okay? Or, or you see like the really chopped down AKs, they call them the, you know, the Dracos, and loud as hell, big ass fireball. Um, uh, so very fun to shoot, <laughs> but also super loud. Um, and also, honestly, guys, the, the loudest gun I've ever been next to was actually not because of the gun, but because of where we were shooting from. We were shooting a very loud gun. It's a Barrett M82, which is a 50 caliber sniper rifle. Big freaking bullet, and it's got a muzzle brake on the end. It looks like a phone, book, a phone book. Okay, it's huge. It vents the gas out to the side. Problem was, we were shooting, we were running a range, so I'm, I'm next to this damn thing all day, and the range had a roof, uh, had a metal roof that's about this tall. So all day long, I was next to this thing underneath this metal roof. It was like living inside a drum <laughs> that was being beaten all day long. So That's the I, worst headache I've ever had. I think I got traumatic brain injury from that so thing, seriously. Had a, had like a, a wooden bucket they used to collect brass and put it too close to that, to that uh, flat, the, the, the muzzle brake, and they put a hole right through it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, guys. One thing, too. Muzzle blast can damage you. Like, okay, you see in the movies, two guys are wrestling. Like John Wick. The jujitsu fighting with guns next to your body. Okay, there is actually a lot to fighting with guns, hand to hand combat. We've not got into that at all. If you guys would like to see some wonderful videos about how to use guns in extreme, it's called extreme close quarters, ECQ. And there's, there's a class called ECQC. It's run by a guy named uh, Craig Douglas. Look up ShivWorks, S H I V W R K S, ShivWorks. It's for extreme gun, extremely close gun fighting. Because if you're in wrestling dif- distance with a gun, it's a very different thing. Uh, and I, I did this training a year ago, and I, I've been doing this my whole life, and I love this stuff. I got my ass handed to me over and over and over again. I got bit, beat like a rented mule. It was super educational. And we're out there shooting each other with sim rounds because we are actually wrestling with firearms. It is really different, but if you are writing a John Wick kind of thing, if you can go take an ECQC class or at least watch Craig's videos, do it. Very educational. It is not what you think. Okay. We're done. We're, We're done? Mm-hmm. Oh, crap. <laughs> Guys, there's so much stuff to cover. <laughs> I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Okay, hey, uh, real fast, I have.